Luli Faiba interviews Jesus on the subject of God's attributes and qualities. This is session two. The interview took place in Wondai, Queensland, Australia, on the 31st of May, 2012. Okay, hello, welcome. Um, we're back here for the second interview on uh, God's attributes and qualities. G'day, Lily. Hello. Um, yeah, I'm Lily Favor, as you just said. <laughs> uh, cool. All right. Um, so, uh, there's a few questions that I'd like to just kind of clear up from last week before yep, we go back sure. to talking about uh, some of the other attributes. Sure. Yep. Okay. Um, so, last week, we were talking about God's location being outside the universe yep. and how God um, comes into the universe to hear our thoughts. Well, God doesn't have to come into the universe to hear our thoughts or come into the universe to do anything else. God, but God is able to come into the universe with parts of his or her nature. So there are certain things that come from God that can enter the universe, just like there are certain things that are in our nature that can exit the universe. So, for example, when we say a prayer to God that we actually feel from our heart, that, that actually has causes particles to exit the universe and then enter God's location or enter God herself. And when God has feelings uh, for us, um, those feelings pass through the boundary of the universe and into our actual soul. And so therefore we've got communication occurring and transmission of matter occurring between ourselves and God uh, throughout, not only throughout the universe, but also the, the communication exceeds the boundaries of the universe because God obviously exists outside of the universe. Okay, so when you said that God comes into the universe, you're talking about certain feelings and the divine love and energies that God... Yeah, let's call them certain qualities or attributes of God enter the universe. God himself or herself does not seem to enter the universe in the sense of, in the sense of fully. And in fact, I believe that that's probably not possible for God to do so in the sense that... Um, in, in the sense of um, uh, God is too large to, for the universe to contain him or her, not in the sense that it's physically impossible, but rather in the sense that it, the universe is too small to contain God. Right. So has God ever um, manifested physical bodies or spiritual bodies? Well, no, there's no reason for God to do so. Um, God has had children, obviously, and we are the progeny of God. And uh, if you like, we, being the progeny of God, uh, are able to manifest or are able to create a spirit and material body for people to actually enter. So, so from, a, from that perspective, um, the universe was constructed as the playground for God's children rather than the playground for God. I'm not sure how big God's playground is, but I'm fairly certain it's much bigger than the playground that he's made for his children. Well, one reason that God might want to manifest bodies would be to teach people about God. Um, God always uses uh, what he's created to teach people about God, including the souls of his children. And so the reality is that God does not need to manifest a body in order to teach people about God. And in fact, God uh, wishes for people to learn about God through this real, really a much more smooth and also, um, you could say, indirect manner. And thirdly, you'd have to question why God would want to manifest a body when, when the body itself would be a restriction of God's nature. Um, so the only reason why we have a physical body, for example, is so that we can express our nature, not be restricted by it. Um, now, when we lose our physical body and we go to a spirit body, we're less restricted again. So we're growing through the process from full restrictions. In other words, we don't know how to utilise our free will. And, and by using our body and expressing our body, we begin to learn our free will. We learn how to use it. We learn how to, what happens when we live in harmony with love and we learn what happens what, when we don't. And as the process of learning goes on, then the physical body becomes a constraint. And once we enter the spirit world, that constraint is lifted. And then we have a spirit body, which we can use to grow further. And once we've, end, we've gone through the process of growing with that body, then that body starts becoming a constraint. And now we can begin learning, or now understand the soul and how it learns. 
So then now we're not constrained by either a physical body or a spirit body. Now, I'm not saying that we have to uh, not be constrained by a physical body or, or a spirit body in order to learn, but what I'm saying is the body is actually a tool for our learning, whereas uh, God does not need a tool for his learning, and God also doesn't need to create tools other than the tools God has already created for our learning. Um, there's already a, a, a myriad, and I believe an infinite an amount of tools that God has created for us to learn. And so there's little need for God to, um, cr to actually then become present within the universe in a physical form. Okay. Um, so God puts divine love into the universe, obviously, mm -hmm. into, so that we can receive it if we long for it. Um, does that divine love also affect animals and inanimate objects? Well, you could say that God has two uh, forms, and in fact many forms of love, but the primary form of love that God has for his children is the divine love. But the form of love that God has for all creatures uh, and the general love that God has for all creatures is a different type of a love in that God gives that love to all creatures and all, of, all objects within the universe in ever-increasing amounts. And uh, if any object in the universe is open to the reception of that love, then, then, the, then that thing or object will receive that love and therefore ha have a transformation. And sometimes those transformations can be evolutionary steps that are, that, uh, that are all of a sudden changing into greater evolutionary steps rather than a slow process of evolution. So, so in other words, there's an evolutionary step where as God gives more love, the, the, um, the capacity of the universe to change becomes greater instantly and as soon as it becomes greater the change then it's possible for any living organism and anything within that universe to change in an evolutionary step rather than in a slow process. Now of course uh, from our perspective because we are the people with souls and from God's perspective uh, and our, our perspective we have the greatest capacity to change and uh, that great capacity comes from the infusion of divine love into our soul. But animals can't receive divine love in, the, in a personal sense, in the sense that they understand that they are having a relationship with God. Animals under, uh, are automatically in a relationship with God through their creation and have a relationship with us automatically as well through their creation, but they don't actually have a soul that they can receive divine love with and use their intellect or their will to, to actually absorb. Whereas humankind, uh, the way God's created our soul, we, we are the only organism that can actually embrace that process in a knowing uh, and understanding manner. So, <clears throat> so when we receive divine love, it, it stays with us forever. So how does that work compared to when, you know, someone like a person gives another person natural love? How, does, how is it that the divine love is a permanent thing? And because the thing is a part of God, anything that is a part of God is uh, forever exists. It's, uh, it, it cannot be erased if something is a part of God. Something that is not a part of God often does change and can be erased. So, for example, if we look at it from a purely material perspective, um, this table, if we do not make, uh, uh, maintain it, it will, over time, degrade because of the processes of degradation that occur in an, in an oxygen-based environment and other chemical environments. And as a process, that will slowly do occur over time. And eventually, we'll end up with the table completely absorbed into other materials or other matter, and even in, absorbed eventually into other living things. That process of degradation occurs automatically um, over, over time because it, this table doesn't have God's love in it. And as a result, it has to go through this pro pro process of change. The same applies to any substance that comes out of us as a human that isn't a part of God's nature. So anything that I can give to you, which is part of my love for you or my care for you or any other thing that I do for you, it can degrade over a period of time, not only in terms of my expressing it, but also in terms of how long it lasts or how long an effect it has inside of you. The difference between that and God's love is, is quite marked in the sense that God's love, because of its infinite nature and because it's a part of God, it cannot degrade over time. It can only be suppressed. So in other words, you can have divine love enter you and it be suppressed in you through an intellectual process that you actively are involved in suppressing, but, but the love still exists within you. You can't erase it once it's entered. 
Whereas uh, if my love enters you as a substance, which, which is possible to occur, over a period of time, whatever you do with it, uh, because I am not immortal uh, without God's love, and, uh, and I, my love itself doesn't create immortality, my love itself can degrade over a period of time, or the love that I express or that enters you from me. So therefore, um, whatever happens in terms of my love given to you, over time, if I, if I all of a sudden decide not to give it, over time it will diminish in you and perhaps even disappear. And, uh, and, and you may have a dim memory of that love being expressed to you at one point in the past, but now you don't really feel that love entering you at all. And, and that is very, very different to God's love. Once God's love enters the soul of an individual, the, the soul of the individual is automatically transformed. Now, it depends on what they choose to do with that love as to what happens after that. If they choose to suppress it, if they choose to act in disharmony with the love that exists within them, that divine love that exists within them, then of course they can deny and suppress the effects of that love and even act as if it didn't even exist in the first place, but the love still is present within the soul. It cannot be erased once it's entered. Um, do you know what... This is another one of those questions from the beginning of last week. Sure. But do you know what sustains God? Where all the power comes from and the love comes I mean, yeah. Again, it's a, it's a very difficult question to answer uh, because there are just so many possibilities of it um, and it's hard enough understanding where our power comes from, let alone understanding where the source of our power comes from, uh, you know, the power of the source of our power comes from. And, and so that's a very difficult question to answer and, in fact, I feel it's one of those questions that eventually we might be able to ask in the long run uh, and answer in the long run but I feel that mankind, given the time period that we've been on, on you know, as souls incarnated, um, we've still got a long way to go before we can actually answer those kind of questions. I feel we can understand and understand the attributes of, or qualities of God far better than understanding the actual physical form, if you like, if you could call it that, of God, um, because those kind of questions are very, very difficult to, to actually answer. Okay, no worries. Um, well, during the week, I had a whole series... Well, I had thought of a whole lot of uh, attributes of uh, God, so I thought good, maybe... Good, good, good. <laughs> Shall I rub this off, Anna? Yeah, so I thought maybe we could talk them. about them in, in the context of... You know how you um, spoke about you know, the major attributes such as love and power and wisdom mm -hmm. and intelligence? I thought maybe we could talk about them because I don't know where these go under and stuff okay, like that. Okay, good. Yeah. Well, uh, one thing that came to me um, was beauty. Okay, yes, beauty is an interesting quality of God and also E-A-U. Yep. Um, and an interesting quality uh, of, uh, of the entire universe, actually, because beauty exists all the way through the universe. And also it seems, doesn't it, that within our soul we do see certain things as ugly and certain things as beautiful. Um, and I don't believe that all things are beautiful. And in fact, I feel that uh, what our soul causes, whenever our soul acts in disharmony with love, the creations of our soul at that point are very, very uh, ugly uh, in many cases. And that's a part of the feedback system that God's provided to educate us and show us that actually when we act in harmony with love, beauty is the result. When we act in disharmony with love, ugliness is the result. And ugliness in all sorts of ways, ugliness emotionally, ugliness physically, ugliness in terms of disease and, uh, and other harm that we perpetrate on the planet, ugliness in terms of how we respond to each other, and all of those things are the result of a lack of love. And I believe uh, the, that beauty is a fantastic uh, thing that God has created to demonstrate to us um, the, this, this feedback system of how the soul is actually working. Now, of course, unfortunately, um, we measure beauty only by the physical, generally, on Earth, and God doesn't do so, and quite often our soul can be in quite a lot of disharmony initially in our life. Our soul can be in quite a lot of disharmony with the actual feelings within it, uh, with, with the, with the uh, sorry, the physical appearance that it, that it has. So, so in other words, my soul could be connected to two, my spirit body and my physical body. Initially, in my early stages of my development, my soul could be getting darker, but because there is a, usually a seven-year time frame or delay, if you like, upon the physical body in terms of its replication process in the cell structure, 
and so forth, it usually means that some of the ugliness I won't see physically for many years later. And this is why we grow old and die, as our soul educates and then follows its education in terms of a negative direction, in terms of a, um, a, a fear-based, unloving direction, an untruthful direction. It, the soul becomes slowly more ugly itself, this, uh, the, and it then has a lack of energy, which then is fed to the physical form and the spirit body forms. The spirit body form rapidly deteriorates in its, uh, in, in, in its beauty. But the physical form, because of the cell replication time frames and so forth, slowly deteriorate based on the soul's, soul's um, issues and problems or whatever the soul's condition is. So, so this is why when we get, as we get older, we get more wrinkled. Our body doesn't uh, replicate itself properly. Certain parts of the organs start closing down and so forth. And by the time we get very, very aged, a lot of our body is now shutting down as a result of what's happened to our soul many, many years prior in most cases. So that's a feedback system, but it's a slower feedback system um, than what would be present in the spirit world. So what's present in the spirit world is a very rapid feedback system. If you take an action that is unloving in its nature or untruthful in its nature, the physical form that you see, the spirit body form, uh, degrades in its condition fairly immediately and uh, because the cell replication process in the spirit body form is a lot more rapid and so therefore you see the changes immediately as you degrade in condition or even as you grow in condition you also see the resulting changes in the beauty as you grow into condition so getting back to god's quality of beauty i feel there are some <coughs> things uh, that god's sort of inbuilt in our soul that we respond to as beautiful compared to as we respond to as ugly and all of those things in our soul that we respond to as beautiful are all associated with love and all of the things we respond to that become ugly are all associated with you know, all of the things like fear and untruthfulness and everything associated with that being unloving. So I believe that the beauty quality of God is, a, is like a sub-quality. Remember we talked about primary qualities and then we talked about sub-qualities. I believe it's one of the sub-qualities of God's form of justice and also God's love. Um, because when, when we connect with God and we receive divine love, we automatically also start becoming more beautiful at the soul level. And then eventually, if we become at one with God, it affects our spirit body and, and physical body so much that the, both of those bodies no longer age and they are also start improving in their condition. And so God's basically showing us the effects of love. So I'd say beauty is an effect rather than a cause, but it is a part of one of the attributes of what love does. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And actually the next one on my list I think is probably highly linked because yep. that was joy. So right. that seems yep. to be an effect of God that's built into our feedback system as well. Exactly. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, emotions that you could say that we will come to experience in our life that are the direct result or the effects of uh, us embracing other things like truth and love uh, and justice and humility and other qualities which are real primary qualities of God. And as we embrace those primary qualities of God, we'll find that we'll have these secondary effects of joy, happiness, peace and many other qualities that are the results of, or, or they are, I would call them the emotions of or the, or the display of us having the primary causal effect, which, which, the primary cause of it, the effect, which is the love or the truth or the humility or one of the other primary qualities. Mm. All right. Well, I'm going to carry on down with Sure, this. sure. Okay. Um, sensitivity. Sensitivity, yes. Because obviously to be able to respond to everybody's prayers and feelings and feel everyone's feelings, you've got to be pretty sensitive. Very much so. So one of God's primary uh, feelings that you could say inside of God is this direct sensitiveness to every single occurrence in the universe. In the first century, I said that God was so sensitive that God could feel how many hairs there were on your head growing at any one point in time. Right? And God can feel when a sparrow dies, you know, when, it, when, when something, the life force exits something. And God feels when the life force exits any one of God's creations because the life force returns to God and so God feels it. So God is extra sensitive to everything, far more sensitive 
than we are personally sensitive. As we grow in divine love, we become more sensitive to everything around us. And therefore, this sensitivity causes us to not act out of harmony with love. In other words, we become so sensitive to any disharmony with love that it's impossible for us to act out of harmony with love without feeling a huge amount of hurt inside of us at some point. And, and what God is encouraging all of us to do is to allow ourselves to be sensitive. And it's interesting when you see that as a comparison to what most parents encourage their children to do, which is stop being sensitive and uh, trying to encourage their children to be insensitive so that they can cope with the pain of life. The way God views pain is that if, if we were so sensitive to pain and its cause, we would never want to embrace the cause of any pain. And so it makes sense then that sensitivity is one of the attributes of love. And, uh, and so I feel, again, that's one of the attributes of love, of divine love. It's, a, it's a, one of those sub-qualities, if you like, or one of the effects of the love operating on the soul of an individual is they become more sensitive. I think the next one's another attribute of love. Yep. Uh, patience. Patience is certainly another attribute of love, yeah. Um, it's, it's a beautiful aspect of love because what it does, if you think about the opposite to it, which is basically demand and Im impatience, if we think about demand and impatience, what they, what they do is they impose upon another person that you've got to do a certain thing by a certain time. If you think about what the loving thing would be to do, would be to never impose upon another person that they have to do a certain thing by a certain time. You would just be patient and let, let it all operate. Now, that doesn't mean you would break their, your own laws for um, the time frame. So in other words, if a person doesn't want to do a certain thing by a certain time, that, and, and you, uh, then you, it's up to you. You can say, oh, well, I don't want to interact with you're that person on that particular project anymore because they're just taking too long. But that doesn't necessarily mean you're impatient. There might be practical factors about love of other people involved in that. So what I mean by that is that uh, sometimes it is, if there is a group of people working together, if all of the group of people are working together well except for one person, and the group is not impatient with that one person, but that one person is not performing the task that they've been, been asked to do for the group, then the group is wise to say to the person, well, obviously you don't want to do that and that's fine. You're allowed to not want to do that and we're totally patient about that. But we, we want to go ahead and do this so we would like to find a person who, who does want to embrace that process with us. So we can be patient and still have deadlines. Does that make sense? Um, a lot of people would feel opposite to that perhaps, but the truth is that we can feel patient and have deadlines. We can feel patient and have rules. And God does have laws but God is still patient. So God's patient about every law you break. God goes, well, there they go again, broken another law. And there they go again, feeling the pain of the breaking of the other law. There they go again, seeing their beauty degrade from breaking this other law and their sensitivity degrade because they broke the law. And, and God's going, I wonder when they're going to actually, you know, and God usually does know when, but you imagine there, God there, I wonder when they're actually going to actually work out the fact that they're, they're doing something that's unloving and change. And God is very, very patient as a result. So, so we get a lot of patience from God. If, we had, if God was totally impatient, then I don't think most of us would be alive at this point because it'd be, um, if you think about it, there'd be so much pressure on us to change from coming from God that it would be very, very, very difficult to withstand it. And you'd have to also have to question whether we'd have free will anymore if God was impatient. So the reality is that patience is definitely one of the primary qualities of God, of God's nature. And as we receive more divine love, we become more patient as a result. Yeah. And it, it helps if you've got this everlasting infinity of time as well to be patient. Exactly, of course. <laughs> you, from God's perspective, God's got forever wait to wait for us to come to God. And, um, and so there's no need for God to hurry. And there's no, that being said, um, I do feel and believe that there is no reason for mankind to not hurry. And what I mean by hurry is, well, what's the point of delaying a relationship with somebody who's going to bring you joy, beauty, love, kindness, compassion? Uh, why would you want to delay such a relationship? 
So, so from mankind's perspective, if we, if we embraced God truly, if we really had a desire to know God, we'd obviously want to embrace God um, right now as far as we're able to. Um, so, but that doesn't mean we need to be impatient with, ourser- with ourselves about how we go about that process because we've got different injuries and emotions we need to address. We've got different belief systems that we've imbibed through the environment. And these all need to be released before we can enter this relationship. And we need to be patient with ourselves in terms of finding those particular problems, you know, and releasing those particular problems. And we haven't got God going up there going, when's Luli going to do this? You know, like, and and imposing all of this will upon us. I do that to myself. Often we do it to ourselves, (laughs) which is actually a mark of being unloving to ourselves. And that's also an indication that we, we need more of God's love to understand that we also need to be patient with ourselves. Mm. Yep. They're beautiful qualities of love, all of them, so far. There's another one. I think this is coming under the love category okay, as well. Fine. Perfection. Yeah, perfection is very associated with beauty, I feel, uh, in that um, beauty is more taken for most people in terms of their definition is more taken to be like physical beauty something that's attractive to look at and attractive to hear or listen to and attractive to um, see attractive to taste and so forth perfection has a lot of other hallmarks to it besides beauty it also has the hallmark of being perfect in function and form and so so beauty is about the form and perfection can also be about the function how perfect the function is so if you look at our body as an organism it's a very very perfectly functioning system and if we look at the body's diseases even as a perfect functioning system we can see that as our soul degrades it creates disease that tell us that our souls are degrading so we know through this feedback system what's happening to our body it's a perfectly functioning system even feeding back to us what we're doing one moment by moment and it's also a perfectly functioning system in terms of the reception of pleasure. So, so we've got on one hand the pain, which is the feedback system telling us that something's out of harmony with love, and then on the other hand we've got this perfect system that tells, gives us a lot of pleasure through sexual pleasure, joy, peace, and other, other qualities as well that we absorb through the process of engaging things in love. And, and as that happens, we get all these pleasurable sensations in our body. And... And so our body becomes not only perfectly beautiful, beautiful but also perfect in, it, in its function and how it functions. And this is a result of love as well. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, how about efficiency? Uh, efficiency or economy, shall we call it? Yeah, that efficiency. was another one further down the line, yeah. And economy... Yes, um, these are two very, very interesting attributes of love as well. Um, but they're sub-attributes of love as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there's a lot think. of attributes of love. <laughs> yeah, and because um, when you become more loving in, towards anything, or your environment or even in yourself, everything that happens within you all of, a, all of a sudden becomes also more efficient. In other words, you don't want to waste time, either of your own time, or of anybody else's time, or even of nature's time, or the environment's time. You also don't want to waste resources. You have a love for the... Your love for the resources is so strong that you only want to use them in an efficient manner. You don't want to abuse them. And you also have an internal priority system that happens as a result of this efficiency in the sense that you prioritise your life around the things that are the most important, which are all to do with divine love and and all of those kind of things, and you prioritise your life so that those particular things become your highest priority, and everything in your life is geared towards the efficiency of changing your life into more harmony with love and truth, and connecting with God and God's uh, in, in terms of the relationship with God. Economy is an interesting part of efficiency in the sense that it, it also is that if I'm loving, then I will want to t- get the best out of every single thing that I use, not in a um, what I would call in a uh, psychologically disturbing way. In other words, I, like um, some people want to eat all of their food, even if some of their foods are a bit bad, they'll cut off a bit of the bad food and eat the rest of it and things like that. Whereas I feel part of the economy is that all of the living things within the universe need to benefit from these particular 
food sources, for example. So, so when I see a bad piece of food, I, I go, you beauty, that's great. I can feed that to my worms. <laughs> and that, that, that the insects will, will increase in number as a result, and the insects will have a lot of other work that they will do. And as a result of that, there's so many things that will change in my environment. So, so I don't see um, economy as just how it affects me, but also how it affects the entire environment in terms of how I use the systems that I use. Anything that I choose to do that degrades the environment in any way, I need to be very careful about the choices that I make there. Anything that's going to improve the environment, then I, I need to make those economical choices immediately to improve the environment. Mankind, unfortunately, has a focus on money rather than economy. So, so we often do many things that are not in harmony with economy but are in harmony with the dollar. I often wonder, you know, when uh, making roads, for example, we often see that uh, the roads are made by having people at each end stopping the traffic flow and then you have a whole long stream of vehicles all piled up in a row, um, all still with their engines on, all with the people sitting in the cars doing very little at all, which means that there's very little efficiency in economy. And, uh, and, and it's all done for a road that if the road was done at night time, for example, where there was far less traffic, or a second road was built alongside of it rather than the road itself, even though it would be more expensive, it would actually be far more efficient and economical to everybody involved. But unfortunately, mankind is not very good at measuring all of the economies or all of the efficiencies. They only measure the efficiencies with respect to money. God doesn't do that. God's efficient right across the board with all things. And uh, all the efficiencies of God are a beautiful expression of God's love. If we look at another part of economy and efficiency, it's this aspect of how God's created the universe. God's created the universe so that all of the living things in the universe have the ability to transform the dead matter in the universe into living things. And so what this means is that if I get a home and I build a home out of dead things, it means that all the living things in the universe are now geared to attack that dead thing, that home. So I'll have insects wanting to eat the wood, I'll have uh, you know insects coming in, spiders making their nests and all these other things happening. And all of these things are a process of the attempt to degrade this home back into nature so that it can be reused by something living. Does that make sense? So every time I create something out of dead material, I am actually not demonstrating very much efficiency. And God, God's not like that generally. God, what God does is creates a lot of living things. And because the living things have higher intelligence, they then also, so intelligence built into them, they then also are able to manage this process of turning all of the dead matter back into living matter in some way. So if you look what happens in a forest, for example, when a tree dies and falls on the ground, it instantly is attacked, if you like, or, or instantly consumed over a long period of time, but it's instantly consumed by fungi, by insects and other living, other living organisms that cause the entire tree over time to totally degrade back into the environment so that it can be a source of food for other alive things. And this is the way God creates everything in the universe as well. So, so God is very efficient in every single creation. It's not just, it's not like mankind. We are, we are generally only efficient when money is involved, <laughs> whereas God is efficient and economical when love and truth, with respect to love and truth, they are the primary efficiencies. And so if we change ourselves to become more like God, we will find we would leave a money-based economy, in fact, on the human, in the human race, we would leave a money-based economy and go to a different type of economy that's more based on what is the efficient and economical thing to do because that's the most loving thing to do. Right. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, another kind of uh, side shoe to that is abundance because there's economy but there's also abundance. Exactly. And, this, uh, and I feel abundance is a part of economy, actually. All oh, right. Um, so if we just list the... the it's A and C, isn't it? It is. And if we list abundance in, the, in our list, we can see that uh, what's, what's often happening with abundance is that we have this um, effect that God, the way God creates because of love, the way God creates is very different than the way we create. When we manufacture, there's a lot of resources that go into something and, and that thing cannot generally replicate itself very easily at all, if, if at all. 
to, to replicate itself, an, an organism needs to be alive for a start. And secondly, it needs to have a genetic code of some kind generally to replicate itself over and over again. Now, God has created all of these very intricate organisms right the way to the most complex, which is the human soul itself. But in the process of creating these organisms, every single living organism has the ability to, to provide abundance within itself. So, for example, if you look at the very <coughs> smallest of organisms, they all replicate very rapidly and therefore, and they all have similar form and function. When you look at uh, things we need to eat, for example, trees or, or, or seeds of any kind or anything to do that provides fruit or vegetables, every single one of them firstly provides the material that we want to eat, but secondly, it, 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 it seeds and has the genetic code for replication automatically involved. And so in every single thing, there is automatic abundance. Like when you plant one peach tree seed, it grows into a peach tree and it automatically, unless it's been genetic modified, automatically fruits, and every one of those fruit have a seed that you can then plant again, and you have another tree, and that first tree is still producing thousands of pieces of fruit every year, while you plant the second one, it grows over a few years, and that's producing now thousands of pieces of fruit. This is just from two seeds, one that came from the other. So that's the that's in a mark of God's feelings of abundance in the universe. But abundance can be created quite easily when you're able to have create something genetically if you can't create something genetically then abundance is very very difficult to create of course and we have to then use resources to create the resources that are the output if you like of the living matter and um, that turns everything over and changes matter around us and then we grab those resources and produce things so man's not very good at producing abundance. We're also not very good at understanding abundance because we do things like eating meat, for example, which is like we get a cow, we, get a cow, we mate it with a bull, two animals needed for that. We, we create a third, a calf, or maybe two calves at, at the most. Generally, if the, one of those calves is a male, he will generally be slaughtered and eaten for meat. And then the other calf, if, if she's a female, she'll generally be grown um, to become a milk source or something like that. But, but if you look at the entire process, to do those two things requires huge amounts of resources around the world. So this is why the rainforests in Brazil are getting cut down. It's to do, to do with a lot of to do with meat production. More, the hum, humankind is becoming more and more desirous of eating more meat. And as a result of that, we have to destroy more things to, to create more cattle to eat, to, to eat, which we are also destroying through the process. And any animal we eat can't replicate. The difference between that and what God's provided is everything that we eat in nature generally, even after we've eaten it, can replicate, which is automatic abundance. So there, there are a lot of things that are a part of God's nature that are part of love uh, that God's provided that that can cause us to see that abundance is a big sign of love actually when we feel abundant yep. so um you've talked about we haven't really talked about creativity yet which is obviously this huge part of god of course that comes under power does it and um, well it's a combination of love and power if you think creativity um, because because crea it's one thing to imagine something within your creative space quite another to be able to produce it. So you could say that the producing of it is to do with what physical power you have to produce it, whereas the imagination of it comes from all different sources and it's a part of uh, the creativity um, is a part of us, but it's also a part of God's nature. Yeah. And you can see creativity is a part of God's nature if you look at the variety. Like mankind, when we do something, oftentimes the things... You know, when we see something new and different, we go, wow, that was pretty unusual, you know. Like, but with, if you look through nature, there's everything, everything is new and different, everything you look at. And, uh, and this is a part of God's nature, how God creates in this very creative, multifunctional way. So every single creation that God creates has multiple purposes. It's not just limited to one thing. Most of the things we create are limited to a few purposes. But when we find something that we create that's, that has many purposes, most, most of the time 
that particular thing uh, you know grows exponentially in terms of its sales you know look at what's happened to the iPhone or the iPad or <laughs> those kind of things that have multiple purposes they often uh, have grown much more rapidly than other devices that uh, we create that are for single purposes so I think you said one time that um, God creates just by the power of an intention mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it automatically manifests mm -hmm. that's oversimplifying it perhaps but it is true that God has the ability to imagine within herself and then automatically for that whatever is imagined to come into being and that thing that comes into being to be automatically in harmony with all the laws and, and, and principles of the universe. And that's a pretty amazing process or quality of God, I feel. The ability to be able to create and yet everything that God create automatically live in harmony with all the rest of the creations that God has made of which there are literally billions and billions and billions um, and in fact you could you could almost say that's an infinite number of creations that are God seems to have created and yet every new creation God creates always fits in with every other creation God's created and the main reason why that is is because of the framework of laws God makes as if uh, with the law if you could say if we look at the framework of laws which is different than looking at these what I'll call probably effects right of of the, of love if we look at the true what I feel is one of the true amazing things about God is that the God's placed a framework in which all of these other things exist and the framework you could call them laws if you want to so they are the laws of God and the primary laws there are a hierarchy of laws but the laws associated with divine love are the highest laws right so they, so they become the laws that govern everything so every new thing that God imagines is automatically in harmony with the laws of divine love every single new thing that God imagines and therefore calls into creation. And as a result of that, it, it, can't, it, it, it is automatically fitting within the framework. And, and that's an amazing thing. Everything we do often, you know, we create a new thing and the laws of man at the time often even say that, like, for example, the copyright laws we had to change as soon as the internet and other and other forms of media, so even when, even when film was introduced and and sound recording was introduced we had to change the copyright laws for every new form of technology that is introduced and the reason why is because the laws every uh, are so limiting that they limit what we're able to create whereas with god the laws are so ex expansional expansional um what's the word i'm probably looking for they are, the laws are so um, all encompassing is probably the words I'm looking for that, that any new thing God creates automatically conforms itself to one of the laws or, or more and therefore um, God doesn't have to go and in, make a whole new set of laws every single time God grows and creates another thing which is pretty amazing when you think about it because it shows you that the laws have been thought of so well that any new thing that God even imagines automatically conform to those laws Covers everything. Covers everything. It's pretty clever. Mm. Um, so how did how does uh, God create our souls? I think you said a few weeks ago in the soul interview that the souls have genetic structure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does God create our souls through a kind of replication process? Um, well, I'm still investigating the way God creates our souls. Um, when when you pass in the spirit world through the different dimensions of the spirit world and you enter what's called the soul union condition of the spirit world. In that condition, you have the, uh, the means to investigate how souls um, operate, if you like, because you're now, you're now not limited by physical body eyes and you're now not limited by your spirit body's eyes. And so now you can observe things with your soul's eyes, if you like, and so are able to observe what actually happens. Now, at this point in time, uh, I can't remember ever seeing a new soul come into existence. So, so that doesn't mean that God doesn't create new souls. I've just never been present when God's made one. And so therefore I don't know the process that God goes through to make one. However, after they've come into existence, I've seen many souls that are yet to incarnate. 
and so I see their basic form and their basic structure and what happens uh, and what happens before they come to Earth and incarnate or to other places in the universe to incarnate. And so um, we have the ability to see what happens after their incarnation, but not yet the real ability to see what happens during their creation. Does that make sense? And uh, that is certainly something that I believe that God desires to teach us. And so that's why I feel that God does want us to learn that process of ourselves of how to bring new souls into creation. Is, is God still creating new souls or you know, don't know? I believe so. But because uh, you, if you think about the universes that I've described in previous discussions, there are many physical universes. Excuse me, I'll just have a cough. <coughs> there are many physical universes and... And therefore, the potential of many pools of, of un, unborn souls, if you like, that are yet to incarnate. And so it makes sense that God would potentially still be creating. But again, as has God has done with many other processes, a lot of these processes are probably automatic in the sense that they don't actually need God saying, oh, we need 20 more souls today, you know, like... Um, but rather that it's an automatic process or flow. Because if you look at everything that God has done, there is always an automatic process or flow in the creation of things. And so that, that then would tend to indicate that God herself is automatically creating as things that are incarnating more is coming um, somewhere, you know, somewhere in, in the universe. Hmm. So is, is God creating other things? Do you mm. know, if, is God still creating other universes even? Yes, um, really? but, but it's interesting how God creates other universes. Um, and that is, a lot of it's done with the aid of the God, creations that God has already created. So if, okay. we, if we look at what happens genetically and, and in terms of evolutionary cycles, we can see that certain things come into existence um, through processes, right? that God has already created that allow for the new thing to come into existence. So, for, so for example, if you could imagine, uh, for example, the existence of trees without insects. Now, trees without insects on this planet would be very, very difficult because insects are a major part, firstly, of pollinating the tree, distributing, uh, oftentimes distributing their DNA, or with other animals, distributing their DNA, but, uh, but the insects also polish off the dead trees. They, they actually turn the dead trees into matter so that other living organisms, including trees, can survive. And so without the insects, you could see the trees would have a lot of difficulty surviving. That being the case, you can see there's symbi symbiotic relationships. So when God created a new tree, there also already had to be some kind of things that God created to support those particular things in their existence. So the way God creates often is lots of things come into existence all at once rather than one thing coming into existence at once. Because when you think about it, if one thing comes into existence in one, at one point in time without there being any supportive network for that thing to exist, then naturally it's going to die. If many things come into existence at once, then there is a supportive network for the things that come into existence and therefore a high likelihood they will survive. And the way God creates is, is not just creating one thing at a time and hoping that it's going to fit into something. God's already imagined how it all should work and then through that imagination can cause through his power to, come, to things to come into existence as a result of the imagination. Right. Um... I was going to ask next. <laughs> I could go in several sometimes, different sometimes directions. Sometimes you get so involved in these interviews. I know, I was like, oh dear, I, I've I lost feel, it. I feel a bit sorry <laughs> for the interviewers sometimes because they get so involved in the re response that they forget where they were in the <laughs> question. <laughs> well, there isn't really an order today, actually, anyway. So. No worries. <laughs> um, yeah, I know, here's one. Um, uh, do you know what other desires God has other than to enjoy creation? Because like, when you said you're in the soul union state, you could, you could feel God's desires really well yes so do you know what they are they're not dissimilar to uh, to our desires in many ways they're just much more powerful and much more loving and creative um, but if you look at our desires again and one of the reasons why god has created a universe like this is that we can examine ourselves as living entities that are that are that, that have free will and we can learn a lot about god in the process of examining ourselves 
but the examination of ourselves has to be without injuries. So in other words, we can't impose the injury system upon God because God is without the injuries, but we can examine the positive qualities that we have and the positive desires we have and the nature we have and all of those other things that we have internally in our soul. And we can, we can say to ourselves, well, if, if it exists within ourselves, that God must also experience it at some level. So if you look at what happens that exists between, you know, in terms of our soul, you can see we have many, many aspects of our life that interest us, don't we? There are some aspects of our life that we like in terms of, you know, looking at how everything happens, observing. There's other aspects of our life where we want to be involved in them. And there's other aspects of life that we're very creative in, in terms of not only creative, in terms of the literal creations that we can use our power to create, but also creative in the sense that we can have a child. So we can create through that process a living thing. We are also able to take genetic code that God has manufactured and, and be creative with that genetic code as well. We're able to, you know, plant a seed, for example, and become creative through the usage of, the, of all of the things that God has given us. So, so if you look at it, we have a lot of different areas in which we express our creativity, we express our joy, we have our pleasure, we have our um, fascination, we have our areas of investigation and all these other aspects. And, and all of these qualities must have come from somewhere um, for them to exist in us. And I believe that God has all of these qualities as a part of her nature as well. So, so God is fascinated with things. Um, God, God is creative. God has an imagination. God has joy. God has sexual joy. God has, uh, as well as physical joy and peace-related uh, peace joy, emotional joy. And so all of these different things or qualities, you could say, or, or emotions, are a part of God's nature. Um, and what we observe in ourselves in a pure state is certainly a part of God's nature as well. So we can assume many things as a result of that about God and then we can investigate, by, uh, we can investigate whether our assumptions are correct. So we can say, well, let's assume that the best part of my nature is that I love. So let's now assume that God loves but God loves better than I do. And another part of my nature that I really enjoy is expressing my creativity. So, so let's assume that God has creativity but is far more creative and powerful with it than I am. Does it make sense? And we can analyse ourselves and what is our pure nature and then we can then say, OK, well, let's make some assumptions that God's like that. But the only way we're ever going to know whether God's like that is to actually experience this personal relationship that I described last week in the interview. And then we'll start to absorb some of that nature of God and then we'll realise that God is like that. And, and not only realise, we'll also experience God being like that, which is different to th assuming that God is like that. And this is where it requires the personal <coughs> relationship. You see, it's one thing to answer all these questions about God's nature but we're never really going to feel any of these things about God's nature until we actually experience God herself by actually entering a relationship. It's like, it's like I, can, I can see you on a television show, right? And, uh, and I can make a heap of assumptions about your nature from that show. Many of them could be incorrect and some of them could be correct, right? And I could make a lot of assumptions about your nature and I could write down all of those things. So that tells me Luli, but I've still never experienced Luli. So I still don't really know, do I? I don't know what Luli is like. And um, I often see this happening in respect to Mary and myself. There are many people who see us on video or, you know, or hear our words or whatever. But because they've never had a personal interaction with us, they don't really know us yet. They don't really know what they're like. They're making a lot of presumptions or assumptions about our nature. And many of those assumptions or presumptions might be incorrect. It's only by engaging the personal relationship that you work out which one of those assumptions were correct and which one of those assumptions are incorrect. And you, because you handle our uh, email line coming in, you often see many assumptions made about myself and Mary that you personally know are totally incorrect because you've had some time spending time in our, car in our company just as I've had some time spending my time in your company, so I know that many of the assumptions that other people make about you are either correct or incorrect but based on my personal experience of you. It's the same with God. So what we need to understand is that we need to have a personal experience with 
with God before we're going to know whether any assumption or presumption that we have about God is true. So, so we can discuss God's nature and characteristics and qualities. However, the discussion itself is really in a way wasted unless we're prepared to have the personal experience of, ha- of entering into a relationship with God to find out whether those assumptions or presumptions are correct or not. And my recommendation to every single person on the planet is do not assume that you know somebody without having some kind of personal relationship with them. And even then, be careful, because many times you're judging them through your own unhealed and unloving nature rather than your healed, loving nature. And so what God is teaching us to do through our interaction with God is once we engage this interaction with God and have the personal experience of engaging God then God, because God does not have any unloving parts of her nature and God does not have any untruthful parts of her nature, whenever I'm not experiencing God, I know that it must be me. I know that there must be something wrong or something that's going on inside of me that causes a block in the relationship because I know that God would never block the relationship. So, so once I start understanding that I can have a personal experience with God and I start understanding that any time I'm blocked in that personal experience, it has to be something to do about love that I need to correct inside of me or about truth that I need to correct inside of me or about humility that I need to correct inside of me that is causing the blockage. Once I release this blockage, I can re-establish the relationship. And if you think about it that way, the, we can then enter this personal experience with God and therefore come to know every one of God's qualities not as an assumption that we think that God's like this but rather as a personal experience that we know God's like that because that's the way God's treated me. So, so I can say, for example, many of the things we've already discussed because I know the way God's treated me and therefore I know that God's nature and quality are like, uh, qualities are like what I'm explaining. I know that God has no anger or rage in her. None whatsoever. So all of the Bible's depictions of a wrathful, angry God coming to destroy the wicked at some point in the future, uh, which is many the hope of many Christians, for example, is not ever going to be fulfilled because God does not have an angry nature. It's impossible for, for God to do such a thing in wrath. And, and, because, and I know that because I've had a, a personal experience with God where as many times God could have been angry with me and has not been. <laughs> So I know that God is only loving in her treatment of me. And so through that personal experience, I get to feel, you see. And then in that personal experience, if I assume God's going to treat me angrily, then I know that there's got to be something inside of me that is causing that presumption because that's not a part of God's nature. And in fact, it doesn't make any logical sense that it's even a part of God's nature. But I can assume that God's nature is loving, but at the same time feel that it's not. And that's because I've yet to release my own emotional baggage about maybe my parents and how my parents treated me. So again, I need to have a personal experience with God directly. <coughs> Excuse me. Not impose my parent belief systems, which have now entered me, upon my relationship with God. And assume God is all those things my parents have taught me without having a personal relationship. Does that make sense? So this idea of personal experience is really important, I feel, to take away from a discussion about God's attributes and qualities. One of God's primary attributes of love is that she wants us to have a personal experience with her. He wants us to express him. He wants us to be able to express ourselves to him and he express himself to us and to have a relationship that is going to withstand time and therefore be able to be developed over a period of time. And we can only achieve that by having the personal experience. Yeah. I'm just going to have to have a cough. <coughs> That's got it. All right? Yep, all okay. right. <clears throat> okay. Um, you mentioned he and she a few times there. Mm-hmm. And one thing we didn't cover last week at all okay. is the masculinity and femininity sides of God. Exactly. This sort of uh, what appears to be, from a sexual perspective, a dual nature is, is, is what we could call it. So could we call it sexuality? The sexuality of God in this case. 
And the sexuality of God is also what God has created in, in the human soul. In the, the combined soul, if we draw a soul, the male part and the female parts of the soul, of which there may be varying quantities. So you may have a soul which has you know, a large male part and a smaller female part, for example. Or you may have a soul that has a small male part and a large female part. Right? And that doesn't mean it splits that way, where you know, it splits into a male and female. It means that when it splits, um, if we could draw this one, if we could say it might split like that, and therefore there'll be a dominant male side and, then, and a less dominant male side, but both will be male. And it might split in this case like that, which would be a dominant female side and a less male side in each half of the soul. Or in this case, it might split like that, where there is a dominant male part and a, do a dominant female part in each half of the soul with a little bit of masculinity and femininity in both. Um, but how it splits determines sexuality. Now, let's go back to God. If God is teaching us by making us in God's image, then it would make sense from that discussion that, that God obviously has a masculine parts of his nature and God also has feminine parts of her nature. So when I refer to God, oftentimes I'll refer to the masculine or feminine parts of God's nature. I see love, uh, particularly the nurturing part of love, as a very, it can be a very feminine part of God's nature. But love is also a masculine quality. And so unfortunately today on earth we, I see many distortions, like there's many females on earth who believe that men are not capable of love, for example. And there's many men on earth who feel that w women are not capable of truth, for example. <laughs> And yet both qualities are available to us in the soul, to both halves of the soul. So therefore, both qualities are available to God as well. Um, I also feel, um, f because of all of these things, that God does have sexuality. If you think about all creation, uh, all creation comes generally from a process that involves sexuality. In other words, a process of the merging of the two halves. And this, I feel, tells us a lot about God in the sense that there's a merging of God's masculine and feminine characteristics in order to create. And so, and there is a different effect from each part of those masculine and feminine characteristics. The masculine characteristics having certain types of forms and the feminine characteristics having certain types of forms. And many times you see them playing out in today's society, even in an impure way. But sometimes you look at it, you can see it's quite pure as well. You see a lot of women, for example, they are very much about enhancing the beautiful, beautiful the creation that a man creates. So in other words, a man might build a house, but he's usually not very interested in uh, putting curtains up or, or any other thing like that. You know, that's, that seems to be a more feminine trait. And, and yet, a feminine, so a man, there's a saying that we have, a man builds a house, a woman turns it into a home, right? And those kind of traits or qualities that are a part of the woman's nature of wanting to do that are a part of her nature. And I also believe a part of God's nature. And, and part of the man's desire just to create the external shell, the structure, or the, I feel that's a part of God's masculine nature as well, to create the structure, the laws, or whatever it is, the structure itself, that allow for things to be filled up inside of it. And so it's the merging of those two halves, if you like, which I don't feel are separate in God. They are just two parts of God's soul, single soul, um, that, uh, that merge during the process of creation. And that's what I term God's sexuality, if you like. Um, God does not wish to have sex with her creations. Just like you, if you were married and had a child, wouldn't desire to have sex with one of your children unless you had some kind of emotional problems, right? Um, and so the reality is that uh, these people who believe that God is sexually involved with her creations uh, are not correct. God is, God is sexually involved with herself and himself the, due, due to the process of creation. And God has created us to be sexually involved with the other half of our soul in the same manner, where we're sexually involved with ourselves and no other part of the creation. And in the process of being sexually involved with each other, we create. 
as a result. And this is how we create, in fact, life. Living matter, living things, is created through this merging of the two halves, if you like. And we have the great example of that, of the creation of a child, a baby, at the time of conception. And that's a beautiful example of how the merging of two intentions and, and two loves come together to create, if, if it's done in a pure manner. And it's exactly the same with God. And my, my belief is it's exactly the same with God, and that's my experience as well. So, so I feel this aspect of uh, masculine qualities and feminine qualities is something that is highly overlooked on the earth with regard to God's nature, but I feel it's an essential and key part of God's nature and qualities. So are, are there certain aspects? <coughs> I'll cough now. Are there certain aspects that are um, entirely masculine and certain aspects that are entirely feminine within God? Certainly. And then, if we grow in divine love, like I can still absorb the masculine aspects and just express them feminine in the feminine way, and you can absorb them and express them in a ma masculine way. Yes, remember, each of us has a little bit of femininity or masculinity in us, no matter what our underlying or dominant quality is. So we definitely will be able to express some of those qualities in different ways. However, um, my feelings are that God created, for example, females in order, in terms of the female half of the soul, to reflect the female half of God's soul in a, in a, in a dominant way. And God created the masculine half of the soul to, to reflect in a dominant way God's masculine half of his soul. That, and in, in the end, that to, is what we're capable of performing. Of course, we do this with very different personalities, which is a different part. Uh, so all of us have sexuality, and personality is separate to the sexuality in the sense of how, how sexuality is expressed. But it has to be expressed within the laws of love. Because remember, the laws of divine love and the laws of natural love are the highest laws of the universe, particularly the laws of divine love and then the laws of natural love are under the laws of divine love. So, that being the case, how I express my personality and my sexuality when it's in harmony with love will cause me no pain whatsoever. When I express my sexuality and personality out of harmony with love, it will cause me a great deal of harm and potentially other people and other things in the universe a great deal of harm. And this is part of God telling us too about her nature. She only creates out of love. She doesn't have creations that are in disharmony with love. Otherwise, if God did, she'd be in immense pain. <laughs> and the fact is God is in no pain whatsoever. So in your relationship with God, you you've feel certain aspects are more feminine and feel you've learned through that relationship with God that so when... when when you notice or experience a part of God or a certain attribute with God, you experience it with a feminine flavour or a masculine flavour, for example? Yeah, remember the experience of God is different to God's nature. So, so, so for example, here's God with a perfect interblending of masculine and feminine qualities. Here's myself, one half of the soul, currently separated... Uh, if you like, well, you know, in our, in our case it's a little different, but the average person's case, we're currently separated from the other half of the soul. So let's say this half of the soul experiences God. This half of the soul is capable of having a relationship with both the feminine and the masculine parts of God. But that doesn't mean that this half of the soul will become more feminine in the process. Does that make sense? It's just having an experience of something external to itself. This half of the soul is also capable of having a relationship with the feminine and the masculine parts of God. But it doesn't mean that its primary part of its nature will change as a result. Do you, do you understand? Because, because it's God's nature being expressed to it, not its nature. So in other words, what will happen is when we enter a relationship with God, sometimes we'll feel certain things from God that are definitely feel feminine in terms of a feeling from God. It won't make me more feminine as a result of feeling it. I am going to retain my degree of masculinity and femininity that I have as an interblending within my soul for the rest of my existence until I become at one with my soulmate. Once I become at one with my soulmate, we are one and therefore we feel in the way God feels. We feel together. Does that make sense? So this can now have a relationship with this as a complete entity once that occurs. This is the soul union state. I don't know if Nina can see that. 
soul union state. So that's the soul union state where we're now experiencing God together. Most people on earth and most people in the spirit world at this point in time, when they begin to experience God, are not experiencing God together. They're experiencing God as the half of the soul experiencing God. As a result of that, they will feel the feminine half of God and they'll feel the masculine half of God as separate feelings entering them. And, and potentially, even when we're in this state, we can feel the feminine half of God expressing something to us and we'll feel the masculine half of God expressing something to us and we'll still be able to do that. But because we are now one, we feel it together, not separate to the other half of ourselves. So, so we don't need to be afraid if we're a male, for example, that if we experience God and we experience the feminine side of God, that somehow that will make us more female, because it will not. Right? And we don't have to be worried if we're a female that if we experience the masculine half of God, that somehow that's going to make us more male, because it will not. And a lot of times on earth, what are qualities that are attributed to masculinity and femininity are not. So, for example, many women believe gentleness is a feminine quality, and it's not. Right? It's a quality of love. It's not a quality of. Uh, it's not a quality that's assigned to gender or sexuality. It's a quality of love. If I'm, if I become more loving, I'll become more gentle. A lot of women on the planet believe that sensitivity is a, or emotional sensitivity in particular, is a sign of femininity, and it's not. Emotional sensitivity is a sign of love. As we become more loving, we become more sensitive, and that's a sign of love. So, so. Some of these qualities that we believe are masculine in nature and feminine in nature are often not masculine or feminine. They're just, they're just our expression of our own injuries, in fact. So often when people come up to talk to me or talk to Mary, they'll say, you know, like things like, oh, I just feel you need to become more feminine in the way you do things. And to you? Yeah, or, yeah, they might say that to myself, for example. And I, and I go, well, how can I become more feminine when I'm a male, <laughs> for a start? And secondly, what do you classify as more feminine? Oh, I just feel that you need to be more gentle with the way you say things to people. Okay, very interesting. So you believe that when I'm not truth, when I when I'm truthful and I, and direct, that that's not gentle, for a start. And then you believe because I'm truthful and direct that that's a masculine quality and not a feminine one. However, you'll find out that God is very on the feminine side, very truthful and direct. Once you connect with the feminine side of God, you will realise in fact that she is just as direct and blunt as the masculine side of God is and just as conforming to law as the masculine side of God is and so this is a misinterpretation of the of the aspects of femininity and masculinity that happen on earth and because on earth we have so much distortion about masculinity and femininity we then push those distortions onto God rather than just clearing ourselves of these distortions and allowing God to teach us about her nature through the experience Again, it always gets back to the experience. If I can experience the masculine side of God and I cannot experience the feminine side of God, then that tells me that I am blocked to experiencing the feminine side of God. Not that God, the feminine side of God doesn't wish to talk to me or the feminine side of God has a certain nature. Right? It just tells me that I'm blocked. If I'm a woman and I can't connect to the masculine side of God, then that tells me that I have the blockage because the masculine side of God certainly wants to connect with me. And uh, that's a part of God's nature at all times. And so I need to go through the experience of releasing from myself the blockages to each half. And I don't remember when I use the term half, I'm not talking here in a... I'm talking here more in a metaphorical or an allegory sense of God's nature because God is one soul who has masculinity and femininity perfectly expressed in that soul. And if I connect only to the masculinity perfectly expressed, but I can't connect to the femininity perfectly expressed, then that tells me that I have blockages inside of myself that prevent me from doing so. Not that God has blockages inside of herself preventing her from doing so. Is, is it harder for people to connect to the feminine side because of the lack of divine femininity that's ever been on the earth? Uh, yes, it is. Um, but it is also difficult for people to connect to the masculinity side of God as well as a, as a result because masculinity on earth has been highly distorted as well. So, so for example, what, what we absorb from our environment is what we then believe about God most of the times. 
And unless we go through a process of just rubbing out what we've absorbed from the environment and let God expressing herself to us or himself to us, we will continue to retain these viewpoints about God that we then push upon God. So, so what, what finishes up happening is that, is that I believe the masculine side of God to be like my environment has defined masculinity to be. And I believe the feminine side of God to be what the environment has defined femininity to be. Unfortunately, there are positives and negatives of both of those definitions. So, for example, many people believe masculinity to be strong and powerful, and God's masculine nature is also strong and powerful. But many people believe strong and powerful can be exercised without any love and gentleness, and they believe that that's the love and gentleness is the feminine side of the power. That is not correct. It is perfectly where God on the masculine side of God is perfectly able to express love and power in a gentle way without femininity. Does that make sense? It's our absorption from our environment, this belief that men are generally harsher than women in terms of emotionally harsher than women, that we then impose upon God. It's not true that men are harsher than women. It's just an absorption from our environment. And men have the capacity to be as sensitive emotionally as women do. right? And as a result, we have the ability to connect to both sides of God. So, so what we finish up doing on the planet is we finish up thinking that the way true femininity is, is, is the way it currently exists on the planet. And the way true masculinity is, is the way it exists on the planet. And these are very bad assumptions. Uh, when I say bad assumptions, they are inaccurate, but they also cause us to then not have an open mind about uh, and allow God to teach us what femininity or masculinity actually is. Many of us also have a lot of definitions about one of those you know, natures of sexuality. For example, with femininity, we believe sometimes, a lot of men believe that femininity is weak, for example. But why do they believe that? Like, because their environment, through their environment, they see women crying, they have a judgment of women crying, they feel that the way the women act are based on fear, they have a judgment of the fear. They don't see that the fear in women is a lot of times created by them, <laughs> uh, for example. So they, you know, they don't see the creation of the fear. They just see it exists in a woman and they see that the woman is expressing her fear many times. And so what they see is that is weak. Now they then assume that the feminine side of God must be fearful. And that's not true. And the feminine side of God must be um, emotionally unstable. And that's not true either. Right? And, 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 when women look at men, they go, "Ah, oh, he's only logical. He's pretty, you know. He doesn't connect with me emotionally. He'll do things if I just tell him what to do. He'll do things, but he won't. Um, he won't really feel about them much. And that's also inaccurate. And so those w women are going to impose those beliefs upon God and believe that that's the way God is with them. But that would also be inaccurate because God has totally different feelings for them than that, uh, both on the masculine side and the feminine side." So we've got to be very careful with masculinity and femininity that we don't judge God through the eyes of our, through our distorted eyes that have been distorted through our environmental experience. So this is why we can only really come to know God when we've got rid of all of those distortions from us. Yes, and through the experience of God. And see, this is why I keep saying to people, and I said it right from the time I was in the first century as well, that without this personal experience of God it is impossible for us to truly come to know God. We can talk about God all the time and still never know God except through the personal experience. And unless you're willing to engage the personal experience, you're never going to discover the nature of God. You can talk about the nature and attribute certain things to God's nature, but never know for certain those things about God's nature without actually having the personal experience. So during your 2,000 years... Have you, um, have you noticed God changing? Because last week we talked about God changing and growing. Mm -hmm. has, has there been a noticeable change for you in that time? Well, I believe that it's very, very hard for me to measure whether God has changed much. Because if you think of the expression of affinity, so let's assume that God is infinite in nature, but let's assume infinite is a measure. <laughs> so from a scale from 0 to 10. Now, obviously, that doesn't make much sense but uh, from a mathematical perspective, but let's, <laughs> let's do this. If, if this is infinity, if that's the distance of infinity, which obviously is larger than that, 
I see myself right now as being right here. Does that make sense? Now, in that space, you know, of being just above zero, right, in terms of my nature, it is, go it is going to be very, very difficult for me to measure what, if this is God's nature, to measure what's happening to the changes in God. I am down here so overwhelmed with the changes that are happening within myself <laughs> all the way through my 2,000 years of experience that it's very, very difficult for me then to go, well, how, how would it feel being God and changing at the same time? Does that make sense? So at the moment, my soul is not cap does not have the capacity to absorb the changes that are in God and even to measure them because of the difference in our condition. Our di the difference in our condition is so large... <coughs> as to be infinite and if and as a result of that it is very very difficult for me to measure god's changes when i am just here so so in uh, response to your question it does not feel like god's nature has changed much to me and the reason why it doesn't is because i'm totally overwhelmed by every little new connection i get with god that that i cannot as a result measure the changes that are in god do you understand what I'm saying there? So, so what I find a lot of people doing is they try, they try to examine God through these intellectual eyes. Now, I can assume, based on my experience of the universe and what changes are happening to me and what changes are happening to the universe that I observe, I can assume that God's nature is changing. I feel that is a valid assumption. But in terms of measuring how much it has and to actually feel how much it has, that is very difficult when I'm just above zero in terms of my own development in relationship to God's development. And so uh, I, I gather you would feel then you've only discovered just above zero of God's nature as I well. I believe so, yes. Yes. So I believe that there are certain milestones in your progression when you discover bits and pieces about God's nature. And, and I think I may have listed them, some of them, in last week's discussion or in the previous discussion. But if we look at the milestones again, there's basically the initial moment of conception. That's a milestone because at that moment, the soul has actually incarnated. So it's actually an incarnation that has occurred. And from that moment, the soul is able to have a conscious experience of the universe that it exists in and a conscious experience of itself. So that is a milestone. That's a, but it's a very, very, it's a very important milestone and essential milestone to every soul ever coming into existence that many souls are yet to experience, by the way, because they sort of live what, in the soul world waiting for the experience to occur. But once incarnation occurs, this process of incarnation is, is, a, is a defining point in our existence. From that moment on, we're starting to experience. We're starting, we even, it's even possible from that moment on to start to experience God's nature if our parents are connected to God. So we're starting this process of experiencing God, even, we can do. So if we had people on earth who are receiving divine love and they have a child, then the child themselves um, can also, through that experience, start to feel part of God's nature in, from the moment of conception on it. So that's a milestone. You could say the next milestone in terms of the soul's progression, is, is at one moment with God. Now, this is, this is the milestone of the transition between the seventh and the eighth dimensions, and it's the milestone that a half of the soul undertakes. Now, there'll be a first half of the soul that undertakes it first. The second milestone for that whole complete soul, so you could say... The first milestone, if we look at, we rub out conception now, because that's the time it happens, but incarnation is the process. Both halves of the soul must incarnate, so there's two times that has to occur. With at one moment, that milestone, obviously I'm going to learn a lot about God through that transition. Now, the transition between there and there, I'm going to learn quite a large amount about God. And at one moment, two parts of the soul have to go through that transition. And then there is the soul union. So I'll just label them properly. Right? It's a, it's a process of the two separate halves of the soul becoming one. That is another time of 
a major milestone in the soul's transition. And two halves of the soul must allow themselves and have the desire to go through that transition. So there's two halves of the soul going through each transition. Right? But they are the major transitions in the life of a soul. Right? Now, most people have experienced that. In terms of percentages, very few people and, and no people, aside from myself in the first century, have experienced that on Earth, but very few people have experienced that in comparison with the total amount of people who've ever incarnated. And as yet, as yet, very few souls have experienced that. But I view that state as just above zero <laughs> on the scale right. to God. Does that make sense? Yeah. And who knows what other transitions that God has. Now, with me in this state, I am now capable of absorbing far more of God's nature, far more of God's attributes and qualities, understanding far more of how God interacts with the universe and so forth than I was when I was there. And when I'm there, I'm, I'm capable of understanding far more about the qualities of God, the nature and personality of God and all of those other things than I was there. That makes sense, of course. That's a part of our growth. But I've also got to consider, if God is infinite, then it means there may be an infinite number of these transitions that my soul needs to make. Does that not make sense? And so, therefore, I am trying to project the future now. This is the points of discovery that I'm trying to engage myself in. Now, every little state that I find myself in, I find myself understanding there's more to understand. <laughs> And uh, most people find that through their life. Now, imagine if there's an infinite God, and I'm just at this point, just above zero. In fact, you could say in this case, if these are the three steps that, I, that I've had to go through as my soul transition, and that's zero, and I have infinity up the top of my scale. So if I, if I draw this now on the side so they can see it with the video. So if I have zero here, and infinity is somewhere up the top here, right? And there's one, two, three. <laughs> I have done those three transitions, and that's where I am. Does that make sense? That's where I am, and understanding God's infinite nature, and infinite qualities, and infinite attributes, and infinite imagination, and so forth. So, so when I look at that, I go, mm, there's not much I understand yet. While it might look a lot from other people's perspective, it's still not very much. Does that make sense? And, and that also helps me remain humble, of course, because I can see that, wow, there's still a lot for me to find out about. And who knows how many other transitions I'm going to have to go through to even approach knowing some of these things about God that I feel I want to know. And so we were talking about um, the, pers the personality of God and, and that being put into different souls, you know, the unique attribute. So also, in the same way, you'd have to meet every single soul in the universe. Eventually, I to feel, see yes. To see that expression of God. Yes, I feel, I feel that if, if I ever get to the point where I've met every single soul in the universe, and that's not in this universe only, but in all universes that God has created, potentially, then I'll have a very, better, a very much better understanding of God's nature than I currently do. Could it be that as God's changing, God's creating new souls with the new attributes? Yes, that, uh, that is also possible. Yeah, and therefore I'd have to meet them as well. <laughs> You're going <laughs> to, to be truly busy. Understand. So, so yes. Can you see how um, you you have to be quite busy busy in terms of your desire to understand God if you want to go through that process? You also can you see this is the reason why I said in the first century that if if I cannot love my brother who I can see, then how can I love God who I cannot see? Because in every single one of my brothers and sisters, there is a quality or an attribute that I need to see to, to understand God better. Mm. All right, well, I've got some more <coughs> lists mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. before. Yes, let's proceed. Okay. Um, well, there's a whole bunch around being quite childlike <coughs> in terms of playfulness and spontaneity. Yes, uh, um, so let's list them. I know you, we call them childlike, don't we? But it's good to list the actual qualities of what it's like to be childlike because it doesn't mean to be a child. For instance, a child has very, very little understanding of its environment. It has very 
little experience. We can be adults with very, very long experiences and very large understandings of our environment and still be childlike. <coughs> so let's look at it. There's spontaneity. There's a spontaneity. Yep. E I T R E I T Y. Is that right? <laughs> Doesn't look yes, right. Yes, yeah, I look right is. on my sheet. Okay. Yep. Spontaneity. Uh, what else did you mention? Playfulness. Playfulness, yes. That was it actually under the childlike bits. Yes. Any others you can think of? Nope. No, not, not at the moment. <laughs> not, at the moment. not under pressure no. anyway. <laughs> not with a camera pointed at me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so when you look at those qualities of spontaneity, playfulness, um, one other quality that I can think of as very childlike is uh, being fully absorbed. You know, as a child, generally when it's in doing something, it doesn't, it's not distracted very easily by other things. Does that make sense? It's fully absorbed in what it's doing. So part of, part of this is being fully absorbed in its environment, like it, it understands its environment through, through the experience. And there are many other things we could list there, but let's start with those three. Yes, each one of these things are a part of God's qualities. Spontaneity certainly is a part of God's qualities. I've experienced spontaneity where God has instantly desired for something to occur and not, not had any, I've not known about it before that point in time. And, uh, and I could feel it instantly. Ah, oh, God wants that to occur, so off I go and usually try to be involved in whatever that was. Um, playfulness, yes, definitely. God has uh, very large feelings of playfulness in terms of desire to be playful with not only all of his creatures, but the universe itself. And in fact, the whole process of God using her imagination is playful. If you look at most of the creatures that we see on the earth, you can understand the playfulness involved in the, cro in the process of creativity because um, God obviously had a lot of playfulness in the creations of many of these things that we see around us. God is also fully absorbed in everything. God does not have moments of distraction. <laughs> in other words, God doesn't go, oh, what, was this? what were you saying? <laughs> God is fully <laughs> absorbed in the moment in the particular thing God is doing. And... And because God has the ability to have so many things happening at the same time, God is actually absorbed in every one of them at the same time to the full extent. And that's something that we eventually come to do in time. So in other words, um, in time, you will be able to have a conversation with many people at the same time. And, and I mean hear them in the response of many people at the same time. And you'll be fully absorbed in every conversation. You won't have... Oh, that one's Joe Blow over there. I don't like him very much, so I'll, I'll be partially absorbed with him. You are just, I'll just be present. <laughs> that God doesn't do that, and neither does a person who becomes at one with God, where you're not, you're not just present without being involved. And uh, being involved is another part of the childlike qualities. Children generally are not fearful of, of involvement. The only fear they contain generally is when their parents have inculcated in them that they need to be fearful then, of course, the child is automatically so. But if that hasn't happened, the child automatically wants to be involved you know, it's like, and asked to be involved even. And that's a part of our childlike nature as well. And, but, that, but that is not the same as childishness. Childishness, I feel, is to do with a lack of development and lack of understanding. And many adults who are 80 years of age on this planet are totally child, childish in the sense they are still angry, manipulative, controlling, you know, and all these other things which are all un unloving uh, creations through their life. And they are not a part of their childlike nature, actually. Mm. Okay. Yep. Um, or par part of fully absorbed, I had attention to detail. That might be related to that. Yes, uh, if you look at everything God has ever made, it has so many multiple roles. It has so many multiple characteristics. It is intricate in detail. Even, even single-cell living structures are, uh, are intricate in detail. Mankind still has a lot of trouble understanding how they actually operate. Um, and so God gives attention to every single little tiny thing. God was so, gives attention. You think of things that we just swat with our hand, like an insect, 
or a mosquito comes along and we just even without thinking, you know, and it's gone, God knew, God felt the life of that insect disappear. God also, um, and return to God, in fact, and God also f felt w what we did in the sense of understanding, when I say understanding what we did, God felt the action and it doesn't, he, God doesn't have any judgment about the action, of course, but he felt it. He, he understood what happened in his universe just then. Right? And if you look at the insect itself, what a small little creature um, to look at and examine. And yet the only time we generally look at a mosquito is when we're just about to hit it. <laughs> Does that make sense? With God, God gave enough attention to detail with it to create it. And not, not only that, create it with a purpose. So that's a part. That's a part of it too. Something happening up there. It's a bird, it's a bird is it? <laughs> so, so what I love about what God has done is God has created all of the God's creations in intricate detail with with a with a focus and attention on it, with a, with an intention involved from God as well for that particular thing to have a purpose, and and God has made every single thing God has made so intensely intricate um, and that there's got to be something in that about love and and when you look at it yes love does look at the intricate involvement of things and love plans for every possible contingency as well and so love uh, love is often very very logical as a result of that so you would say attention to detail comes under love certainly but also comes under truth and power i feel the more powerful you become the more ability you have to have a, have attention to smaller details, because you're not all wrapped up in you're not the big all wrapped picture. up in the big picture all the time. And in fact, you see the intricate detail and how it supports the big picture. So, for example, when I examine the environment, for example, I, I see the soil and I see the the insects and I see them as primary parts of the intricate nature of what God has created. I see any living organism as a, as having intelligence, and so therefore needing to be a part of any system. And 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 yet the average person, when they think, oh, "Do you want to go and create a garden?" Well, let's bulldoze the place, or let's dig holes here, or let's push over this tree here, and let's create what we want without any attention to the soil. Oftentimes, or uh, often the soil because they have to, but definitely not the insects. Most people just totally ignore what happens to them completely. And God doesn't. God created them. God created them all for a purpose and God defined that purpose in an intricate manner. So therefore God, you know, obviously is very interested in them and interested in their purpose. And the more connected with God I become, the more interested I, I am in the smallest of creatures as well as the largest, the human soul. And if God didn't show attention to detail and creating the universe, something would go horribly wrong, wouldn't it? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> That's the other thing, is that when you look at the universe, and, and a lot of people would argue that the universe has gone horribly wrong, and I can't agree, because all I see is the, the things that I've observed going wrong have all been because of what man has created, not because of what God has created. And we, at some point, need to come as mankind or womankind, we need to, at some point, say, look, this is what we're creating. We're creating things that obviously are out of harmony with love, obviously out of harmony with creating joy and peace and happiness and in harmony with creating pain and suffering. And we need to stop and we need to understand that a part of God's nature is to not do that. You know, so any time we see ourselves creating something that's out of harmony with love, out of harmony with joy, out of harmony with beauty, out of harmony with any of the other things we've listed as a part of God's nature, we need to, we need to go, hmm, Yes, I can see I'm out of harmony and I just need to stop. I need to stop this creation for whatever reason. The reason might be because I want to transport myself from one place to another. Water. I need to stop these creations, you see. And the more in harmony I get with God, the more in harmony I'll get with that place where I'll be able to learn how to do things differently and desire to learn how to do things differently so that they're all in harmony with love. Okay. Um, I'll just carry on those a few. Far away. Yeah, a few. Um, impartiality. Yes, I, again, I feel this is a quality that is a mixed quality and the results of love and justice. Um, so justice is a major core attribute. Yeah, I, f I feel so. Um, you see justice inbuilt in almost everything God has done, particularly at the human soul level. 
Um, God is very, very interested in justice. Um, the reason why God's interested in justice is because God sees that when mankind creates injustice, pain and suffering are the automatic results of injustice. And so everything God does is very just always. So, so impartiality is a part of God's justice system as well as a part of God's love. It makes sense that if you're going to have children that you'd love them all the same. And I know a lot of people on earth don't, but that doesn't mean God doesn't. And it would also make sense that you would treat them all the same. And if you, and if you don't treat them all the same, you cause pain. So when you examine a person on earth who's been brought up by a parent, if he's had siblings, you know, brothers or sisters, oftentimes those brothers and sisters have been treated differently. And as a result of that, the person has a lot of pain in them, generally, because they can feel the different, the, how, how differently they've been treated compared to their brothers and sisters. And so impartiality is an essential part of the expression of love. So God doesn't love me more than God loves you. Does that make sense? E even if there's more of God's love in me than there is in you, it doesn't mean that God loves me more or that God doesn't want to love me more and um, what it means is that i have accepted more does that make sense i have chosen to accept more because the reality is from god's perspective perspective that god wants all of his children to love god and god feels love for all of his children impartially in other words god has just as much love available to you as god has available to me so you said before only a few people have made it to the one man out of everybody. Mm -hmm. Like what kind of percentage is that? In terms of, if you look at, uh, if you look at uh, the souls that I'm aware of that, um, that are surrounding the um, earth and the immediate spaces surrounding the earth in terms of multidimensional spaces, at this stage the figure comes to mind of around about 60 billion like souls that I that I know of that have come into into an incarnated phase. So there's still many billions and billions of souls in an unincarnated state, but there's around about that amount at this point. Now, if you look at the scale of of how many souls have come into you know at one moment with God, um, in the scale, you could say um, if this is the in fact I might draw it better this way. If this is the entire 60 billion, right, then just um, around 4% of those souls, right, just over 2.5 billion of the souls, 4%, have come into an at-one-ment condition with God. That's not very many. Right. And, and if you look at the 60 billion... There's around one third of those souls who have passed over. This is in the spirit world I'm talking here, not just on earth. So you'd have to add earth to this. But about one third of those souls, 20 billion or so, are in the hells of the spirit world. Oh dear. <laughs> That's a lot. Another, another one third of those souls are in the second dimension. And the rest of the souls make up the third to the seventh dimensions. So what are we left with? 20, 40... There's 20, take this, 18, 17 and a half, about 17 and a half billion. This is without the population of Earth. You see, to me, that kind of says that something's gone wrong a bit. We haven't been here long. Haven't we? <laughs> no, and this only began 2,000 years ago. Okay. And remember, it's driven by free will. So... By their own free will, two and a half billion people have entered the, the, the one minute condition. I think that's pretty good. <laughs> it just depends on how you look at it. If you look from God's perspective, as you said earlier, God's looking at it from an infinite perspective. 
God will go, doesn't even matter where it is. Sooner or later, they're all going to find me. <laughs> Can you see? The issue from my perspective is, you know, I want to help the people who are in the third, the, these hells and the second dimension and the third to the seventh and on the earth <clears throat> to embrace the process of this, which the extreme happiness of these groups of people are experiencing are not experiencing, uh, not experienced by the others. And so, you know, it would be great if they could begin to experience that extreme happiness. Now, I believe over the coming years this is, this graph will change greatly. Is that as a result, as you said, of um, more divine love being pumped into the universe? Uh, yes, but also the result of our presence on earth being able to deliver divine truth back on the earth again without distortion. That's also a large part of it. And so there's a great chance of us affecting a lot of people in the long run. And when I say the long run, within a few hundred years, there's a great chance of affecting a lot of people in the hells and in the second dimension and helping them progress through the, the, into these more happier states of their existence. Yeah. So um, would you feel that God's plan is for ev every one of his children to be at one with God? Mm. And also be in the soul union state. You wouldn't create... Remember, if you're impartial, you wouldn't create one set of souls to never experience that if that's the underlying purpose, and another set of souls to, never, you know, to experience it. What there may be, though, is times where a group of souls are saying no to God, look, I don't want to do that, and God says, no worries. The offer is withdrawn for a while so that you can feel the pain of that condition, and, and at some point in the future, I'll offer it again, and we'll see how you feel then. You know? And so over a period of infinite time... There is, it is high. It is impossible, in fact, for not for all of these people not to reach this state of at one moment for this state here. From there onwards, of at one moment. Now, if you're talking about this scale, including the soul union condition, then there's only a handful of people that have actually reached that condition, and so therefore, in a percentage, it's hardly anything of this percentage, which is a sad case. But we're only in the beginning of the process. Uh, even though, like, this is a problem on Earth. We look at things like uh, 80 years is a long time, but 80 years is not very long from God's perspective and certainly not pers not long from the perspective of the development of your own soul. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'll, I've got a few more of the attributes yep. and then probably we'll be out of time. No worries. Um, so... One thing I've noticed sometimes when I receive divine love mm -hmm. is that there's a nurturing and protective quality to it. Yes. Yeah. Um, part of the quality of love is to nurture. And if we look at the word nurture, it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a word that sort of keeps us embraced, if you like, while we go through change. That's the whole process of nurturing it. Like if we look at nurturing a child, for example, we nurture the child so that it has the ability to change in the most rapid possible way. And part of God's nature is to continually nurture his children so that they all have the ability to change in the most rapid way. Unfortunately, many of God's children also exercise their will in a negative direction, which means that the people who God is trying to nurture often don't feel very nurtured because of the attacks that they're receiving from others. But from God, the quality is to be nurtured and protected. Yes. Is, is helpfulness a sub-aspect of that? Of course. <laughs> Being immensely helpful. Yes, of course. Any person who wishes for your, for your improvement but also wishes for your happiness is going to try to assist you to become as happy as possible in the most rapid possible way. And therefore, if you look at it from God's perspective, God wishes to be as helpful as possible. So what, what God does is God provides everything possible that we need to be able to assimilate truth. And it's only our arrogance that causes us to reject it. It's only our arrogance that actually pushes the whole thing away, that causes us to criticise. So you'll find even with the listening of, of, from, of this interview... There will be a group of people who listen and criticise and, and they are being arrogant because they are not seeing God's nature and they don't even want to engage the process of seeing God's nature. So how does God help those people? 
Well, God already has ways to help them and try to nurture them. They are using their arrogance to not listen, and that's fine. They're able to choose to do so. And, and, but God is already trying to engage them in other ways so that eventually God breaks through their arrogance so that they finish up listening. Right? So God is even helping the darkest of individuals. Let's say, let's say the mur- what we classify on earth as the darkest of individuals, the murderers, the rapists, the people who influence large groups of other people in a negative way. God is trying through their, exper- to their experience as well to influence them through, to be helpful, to influence them as best God is able given their condition. Remember, of course, that on the receiving end, so this is the giving end, on the receiving end, I before E except after C. We need to be open to being nurtured, open to being helped, open to being loved, open to being treated kindly, open to being treated compassionately, open. So you can see the quality of being open, uh, wanting to have an openness to being nurtured, to being helped, to being loved, to being cared for, and so forth. This is a part of our humility. This openness is where most hum- of humanity falls down while they're on earth. They become quite arrogant, they're not open. As a result of not being open, they cannot absorb qualities God is trying to give to them, but they are personally rejecting. So when we pray for some help, um, how does God actually instigate the help that is then offered to us? Can God, like ramp up laws around us or like no god doesn't change a single law but there is a law about desires right you see when we pray we are engaging laws that we're not otherwise engaging one of the laws we're engaging is to be open there must be an openness in you before something can be given to you by god does that make sense when i pray and it's a sincere prayer driven by a passion and desire inside of myself as a feeling, my soul becomes open. When my soul becomes open, now I have the capacity to absorb the gift that God is giving. Right? This is the operation of prayer. Prayer does two things, not one thing. What it does, firstly, is it creates a, you could say, a condition inside of the individual of receptiveness so it has the this this transforming effect on your own soul in, initially of creating a condition where you're willing to accept something in other words it actually opens you to humility does that make sense it opens you to becoming to 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 being open to receive now that you're open to receive, something can be given. And so the second thing it does is that it, it, it transmits what you desire to the person who's capable of giving it, God. So, so it also is a transmission of desire. So... It could even be a desire that, that is out of harmony with love, by the way. Right? And if that's the case, it won't be answered by God because God is incapable of answering any desire out of harmony with love. But if it's in harmony with love, we're transmitting a desire in harmony with love to God. Why would God not want to give? Now, when God does give, because we've already created a condition of receptivity inside of us through the process of prayer, prayer we're going to receive does that make sense? Yep. We, we're going to receive because the openness inside of our soul emotionally has been created. So um, prayer has a multitude of effects upon us and uh, upon our soul. And it's not the prayer that uh, we're talking... It's not the same kind of prayer that most religions talk about, you know, a prayer that comes from the mind, a rote learning of a certain type of a slogan or a series of statements that we then say over and over again. None of those kind of prayers obviously can open our soul so therefore they don't those kind of prayers do not create receptivity and many times although they may be a transmission of desires because we're not already open 
we will never receive anything, even if God wanted to give them. So last week you talked about the particles that travel from us to God. Yes. Um, which are emotions. So emotions. The particles are emotions. As yeah, well. yeah, they are actual emotions, which are particles. They are. They have colour, sound, taste, smell. They're all. They're, they've got all sorts of qualities. These emotions that come out of us, and the emotions that we transmit towards God are particles that actually exit our universe and enter God. So they're a, a different type of emotion than for if I project an emotion at you. It's, no. It's the same thing. Same kind of but thing. But a different particle. Um, well, one no, both come from me. They're the same kind of particle. Comes from me and enters another person. God has created all persons the ability to transmit emotions towards each other and to receive them. And as a result of that, and it instantly can occur, and as a result of that, these particles are not bound by space or time. They uh, involve our emotions, our, our feelings, and, and our passions and desires. And they create, if, if they're in harmony with love, they'll create receptivity, a condition of receptivity and a transmission of desire. Now, they can also be out of harmony with love and they'll still create a, reception, a receptivity condition. So in other words, I could have a desire to go and do something evil. right? And, and that's going to create, create a receptive condition in my soul that accepts evil things. Does that make sense? In other words, I accept uh, that I want to create that particular thing and I'll also attract to me, as a result of that desire, I'll attract to me people who will show me how to do evil things, naturally. So our prayer can be exercised in a negative way as well. We can actually have a prayer. But, but if we're talking about the kind of prayers God answers, then God can only answer the prayers that are directed towards God, a transmission of desire based on a pure motivation of love, right? based on a pure motivation for truth or love or humility, in particular those three things, but also for justice and other parts of God's nature. We can pray for anything that's a part of God's nature to enter us, but it has to be a pure desire and we have to have an openness to the reception of it before it's going to benefit us. So um, when someone in the Bible, and it might have been you, I can't remember, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> said that uh, man was made in God's image, was that you? Was that um, someone no, else? It's, it's also said in Genesis, in the book oh, of Genesis, okay. that man was made um, in uh, uh, Was that referring to the souls or these part the souls? Yes. So, how, like, is, God is a soul. How, how have you discovered that? Well, um, I'm not saying that God's soul is created completely of exactly the same matter as our soul. But the fact is that we are God's children in a pure sense and in a physical uh, sense as well. And when I say a physics, scientifically physics-based sense, we are children of God. That being the case, we are made up of, our soul I'm talking about now, is made up of very similar uh, particles as God's soul. And the fact is that we can receive particles from God's soul. Divine love is one of them. And we can transmit particles to God's soul that God receives. And our love is one of those particles. The reality is that we, if we can transmit particles between ourselves and God, and God can transmit particles between God and ourselves, then it makes sense then that there's very similar matter inside of our soul as there is inside of God's soul. It doesn't mean that we have the complete set of matter inside of our soul that's inside of God's soul, because God's soul is much larger and much more infinite in nature. But it does mean that there is a high likelihood of similar particles existing in both souls. Does that make sense? And, and so with us being souls, we communicate in a certain way, and then you can communicate with God in the same way. Yes. You know how we communicate at the moment? We have our soul, we have our spirit body, which has its mind, we have our physical body, which has its brain, and we have a feeling in our soul that generates a thought in our mind, which then is translated to angry language in our brain, and then we speak it. It's a very, a very inaccurate form of communication. If we could just transmit coming out of the soul to the other person's soul, then that would be a very accurate. It doesn't have to go through intellectual analysis and it doesn't have to go through language translation and speech and it doesn't have to go on the receiving end through hearing device and it doesn't have to go through, again, the, the reverse translation, which often f 
thwart with dangers of its own and then back into his mind and then back into an emotion. Transmission of emotions using this method is very, very cumbersome and also not very accurate. And this is why I can say many things and I'm often feeling at the same time in a person that they have no idea what I'm saying to them because they're hearing something completely different because they're not hearing my feelings. They're hearing my words. Does that make sense? Now, with God and us, God's teaching us to hear his feelings for us. And God's teaching us that we need to have feelings for God in order to have a relationship. And in a way, God's also teaching us this is the best way for us to communicate, you and I. If you and I communicate with feelings for each other, now the feelings will be much more accurate. We'll be feel the feeling rather than having to interpret the feelings. And this is why you can be talking to some people and the words coming out of their mouth are all words of love. And at the same time, you feel like you're being attacked or you feel like you're being harmed. And that's because the feelings coming out them aren't in harmony with the words. So they've learnt to, to cut this part of themselves off and this part of themselves has a totally different way of feeling than this part of themselves is expressing. God does not wish us to do that. God wishes us to learn how to communicate with our feelings and how to even communicate our feelings, even if we've got to communicate them with words, so that we can actually feel each other more accurately and not base things on all of this interpretation process, which is thwart with miscommunication. Um, and this is why I find many people who listen to my videos and listen to these interviews and so forth, they don't get to feel me unless they're open enough to stop the intellectual barrage that they get inside of themselves about what I'm saying. If they could feel me, then they could feel my sincerity. If they could feel me, then they could feel my love for them. If they could feel me, they could feel that I'm stating the truth. If they could, you know, all of those things they could feel. But the fact is most people were still very detuned from their feelings. And as a result of that, they're also detuned from God. Because the only way God can transmit her feelings to you is by you being open to feelings. <laughs> and that's the only way that God can transmit her feelings for you to you. So, so what I'd encourage everyone to do is that when we... This discussion of the attributes of God is a very important discussion. But it's more important, I believe, to understand that while God has all of these attributes... I am never going to personally experience them unless I enter this experience with God. And to do that, I'm going to have to be humble. I'm going to have to be very truthful with myself. And I'm going to have to want to learn how to love uh, because that's the thing God wants to teach me the most. And if I could do that, then everything will change quite rapidly in my own life and in the lives of people around me. And I, I sort of feel like uh, the attributes of God and the qualities of God are all geared to help me do that. Every one of God's attributes and qualities that I've personally felt have all been geared to help me come to terms with love, come to terms with truth, to be humble and to just be open to this process of learning how to feel everything around me, to be sensitive to everything around me. So my last question is, I was wondering, it could, we've, as you said, we've talked about all these attributes that are all... Yeah, great. Um, could you summarise what's the benefit of actually connecting to God? You know, what, what do we get out of it? Well, I think the benefits are, have probably been explained through the course of the interview in the sense that uh, the, the qualities of God, once I connect to God and become at one with God, the qualities of God enter me. So I become joyful all the time, not just some of the time. I become um, you know, desirous all of the time, not some of the time. I become creative all of the time, not some of the time. I become spontaneous all of the time, not some of the time, and so forth. All the things God is, is what I start to become. And if you, if you think about it from that perspective, there's so much involved with that in terms of the, the beautiful results of having a connection with God. All the things that God is not, I become less of as well. So in other words... Uh, once I become at one with God, I'm no longer angry because God's never angry. I'm no longer sad because God's never sad. I'm no longer, you know, all the things that are unpleasant to experience and painful to experience in this life all disappear as a result as well. And I know it's difficult for most people on earth to trust that and for most people on earth to, to even believe that that is possible. But, but it is possible and we can trust it because God is far better 
in characteristics and attributes than any individual on this planet. And if you think about the best individual on this planet, whoever that is, God has far more love than they do. God has far more kindness, compassion. God has far more of these attributes of truth and humility than they do. God has far more of every one of those qualities. Now, if God has far more of it than any one of those qualities, then God's imagination of what this earth could be is far better than any person on earth's imagination of what it could be, even in their most positive moment. So having a Pollyanna attitude or an attitude of positivity about God and God's creations and the future, I feel is an automatic result of understanding where God is and understanding what parts of God's nature can enter me and transform me. As those parts of God's nature enter me and transform me, I will automatically become more and more of what God is, more and more kind, compassionate, understanding, just, humble, modest, and all of these other kind of capacities, uh, attributes and qualities that God has enter me and I become more like God. And that's why in the first century, century I said you must become perfect just as your heavenly Father is perfect. And as you do that, you will go through this transition of becoming more and more like God, so much that not only will you personally understand God's attributes and qualities, but anyone around you will begin to also understand what God's qualities must be through your interaction with them. Awesome. <laughs> That's good. Thanks very much, AJ. It's been a delight. Thanks, Lily. Yeah, and thank you for the, our videographers today. Um, so, again, it's been Igor over there on the on the sound, and it's been Lena over there who needs to poke her head out from behind the camera, and Vlad who <coughs> needs to poke his head out from that camera, and who's been filming us today, and we've just had a couple of people in our audience today as well who have been quietly listening. Thanks, guys, for, for being involved in our presentation today. Thank you. Thank you. It's like suddenly everything goes quieter, even though it was already quiet. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Is that spirits? Yeah. That like are really really listening hard at that point in time. Yeah, a lot of a lot of the time w w with these interviews, we have huge numbers of spirits present. Um, from you know, who is this why we were coughing so much? Yeah, sometimes okay. uh, there are some spirits who want to say, oh, but what about this and what about that and what about this and that causes you to be a bit congestion. You have to work over that. Um, a lot of times these spirits are involved in the process of, uh, of this because they, they've been brought here by other, by other spirits who want to give them the answers that they've been looking for and, uh, and often connecting to a person on earth is easier for them to understand than a person in the spirit world who's transmitting, trying to transmit feelings that they can't feel. So that's why suddenly it's already quiet and then it's like it silent. just got quieter. Yeah, yeah like yeah, yeah. spirit wise it goes silent. Yeah. So when the spirits who are around us go into a state of um, what you call contemplation, you'll find everything goes very, very quiet. Before then they're in a state of what about this and what about that and what about this and what about that without actually hearing the answers. And then when it goes nice and quiet, that's because they're in a state of contemplation about the material. And that's when everyone's very self-reflective and, uh, and you hardly hear any of a barrage from the spirit world as a result of those moments, yeah. It's good having those moments. It's, it? Yeah, because then it's like, when you're actually here live, then it's like, oh, there's a really special bit happening, you know? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. These are like bulb moments, I Yeah, they yeah. are. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of times like people have these uh, times of, you know, in the spirit world, uh, listening and conversation, ah, oh, ah, oh, oh, I didn't realise this, oh, I didn't realise that. And as they have these con this personal contemplation and reflection, they go into this very quiet and less agitated state, and therefore it feels more peaceful uh, on Earth as well as a result. Yeah. It just gives such a different perspective to the purpose of our life on Earth. Like, yeah. It's just such a different view. Yeah. And, and the word patience keeps coming up for me because I thought, well, we're so impatient, it's just ridiculous. Yeah, ridiculous, yeah. It is ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. how impatient It has our place. Yeah. yeah. And so opposite to the concept of infinity. Infinity, yeah. infinite time. It is. Mm. It's one thing to have desire. Mm. You know, of course you want to desire to change as rapidly as you can change, but mm. quite another to have impatience about desire. Mm. Uh, I feel also that, um, you know, there are many spirits in the spirit. When, when we have our seminars, for example, 
the atmosphere is very noisy because you get literally 200 people, 100 people in the audience all bringing along different spirits with them plus there's groups of spirits in the spirit world who all want answers without really listening to the answers and as a result of that the atmosphere is very noisy and there are times in our seminars where it goes quiet but it's not very often right? because there's just all these spirits who disagree or don't want to engage or whatever it is around. The beauty of these kind of ex of these kind of interviews is there's only a few people around. There's less people here who are antagonistic to the divine truth, and so that creates an atmosphere where people can engage in the spirit world. And that means that there are times when it just goes silent and everyone's thinking and feeling. And, and you can also feel times when we had the discussion, the abortion discussion, for example, where there were whole groups of spirits in the spirit world who just started crying. You know, like they just all started crying at the same time. And, times like that too where you can hear them and it's great it's a great relief to feel that often because you feel them at last getting into some grief and so forth yeah so it's good anyway we better close up thanks guys thank you